Hey guys, so we are actually moving on to the A2 content of Further Mechanics 1. Um, we are going to be sticking with one of the topics that we had done from year 12, apart from we're moving it into two dimensions. So we're having a look at elastic collisions in two dimensions, which is chapter 5. Previously, we were just looking at things that were in one dimension, meaning that they were either going in this direction or they were coming backwards. In this case, things are moving in 2D. So if we have a look at some of these diagrams that we've got down here, we get an idea of what things we're going to be looking at. So we're going to be looking at oblique impact with a fixed smooth surface. Oblique means at angles. So one of the things we're going to look at is a ball that is traveling at an angle like this, and it hits a fixed wall like this. And you can imagine what's going to happen. It's going to come along, and then it's going to bounce off at a different kind of angle that we have there. Um, what this, so that's really what we're answering. What happens when a sphere hits a wall at an angle other than 90 degrees? We're then going to look at these couple of diagrams that we've got over here, where maybe we've got two balls that are hitting into each other and they touch along just one point like this. Or you might have them where they're not coming at the same angle to begin with. One might be coming in like this, another one might be coming in like this. And what we're going to try and do is predict how are these balls going to move afterwards after they've had a collision. So what I've written down here is what happens when two spheres that are not traveling along the same straight line collide. Um, and really, I guess, where does this come up? Well, one of the main ways that this might be coming up is in things like snooker or pool. That's the kind of stuff that you might think about it in real life. And, and that actually gives you some, some good ways of thinking about this topic. Um, obviously, on a smaller level, maybe collisions, we can think of um, particles and things like that too. Something I've written down here is also very, very important. The key to all of these questions, or that should say these, the key to all these questions in this chapter is that all the spheres and all the surfaces are always smooth. And we'll explain during this chapter why that is true. So let's think about some of the theory that we've got here. A smooth surface cannot apply a frictional force. It can only apply a normal force. And I'm going to highlight this word normal because it's just so important for what we're about to look at. Because it can only apply a normal force, the impulse will then always be normal to the surface. So the momentum and velocity is only changed perpendicular to the surface. What this therefore means is that the momentum and the velocity parallel to the surface remains unchanged. I better explain this though, because it's, it's a pretty difficult idea that we've got. Now here is my surface that I've got like this. Now imagine that you were this surface. Because you're just a flat wall, the only thing that you can do is apply a normal force. You can only push like this. So if a ball was going to come and bounce down here, and it's traveling at some kind of angle like this, well, the amount that it's traveling downwards and the amount that it's traveling acrosswards, the acrosswood force, so the acrosswood velocity that we have over here, cannot be changed by this normal reaction. This normal reaction can only interact with this one that we've got here. So I'm going to highlight those and um, saying that this normal reaction can only interfere with this speed. This speed remains completely untouched. And if it's untouched, it will be exactly the same over here. You can imagine, though, that this speed that we've got here, because it's bouncing against a wall, it's probably because of this pushing probably going to lose some of that speed and it's going to result in the angle bouncing off like that. So don't worry too much about the sizes of the angles or anything like this at this stage. Um, all you really need to think about is that the this one here and this one here are going to stay the same, whereas these ones in orange are the ones that are interacting with the normal reaction of the wall. So let's just read what I've written down here. The component of the velocity parallel to the surfaces in contact is unchanged. So this is the parallel component of this velocity. 
and this is the parallel component of this velocity. And I've highlighted them both in yellow because they are unchanged. And I'm going to have to do something up here. So it says the component of the velocity perpendicular to the surfaces in contact depends on the coefficient of restitution. So this one, if I was to call it u, this one would be e u. It would be the coefficient of restitution multiplied by the speed. So that those two red arrows that we have, these two will be different speeds. Okay. Most important thing, these don't change, these do. So let's have a think about a bit of the theory. Now we don't often use the theory very much, but it's kind of nice to see where this goes, where this comes from. So we're going to take these two speeds. This is like the ball that is traveling in here and it's coming along this pathway until it bounces against the wall and then it comes up this kind of way like this. OK, now let's think about how it's traveling. I'm going to do this one in red. It is traveling towards the wall and it is also moving along. This one is doing the same thing. It is still moving along and it has an upwards as well. Um, I meant to do those in a different colour, so I'm going to do those in a green, a dark green. So this running up here is V sine beta, because it's on the opposite, and this one would be V, v cos beta. Going back to the one that we have on the left, the initial speed. Come on, what am I doing wrong? There we go. This is u sine alpha because it is clearly opposite the angle. And then the other one must be u cos alpha. Now, we said some of these things earlier on, and we're going to say them again. We know that this one and this one remain unchanged because the wall can't do anything to those. All the wall can do is exert an impulse on the ball and the impulse has got to be at 90 degrees. So our first statement we can write down, and our first statement that we can write down is that V cos beta must be the same as U cos alpha. Now, because of the collisions that we've got here, we know that the, um, that the coefficient of restitution E is the speed of separation divided by the speed of approach. And you should remember that from year 12. So the speed of separation is V sine beta and the speed of approach is U sine alpha. So just rearranging that, I get that V sine beta equals E U sine alpha. I'm going to write it down under here. V sine beta is equal to E U sine alpha. Now, my aim is to try and connect these together. And really, by connecting them together, I'm going to solve them simultaneously. That's the kind of idea. Now, if you've been watching my trigonometry videos, you will know some identities that connect sine and cos together. And I'm going to just tell us the trick for this one. Um, we're going to try and use combine sine and cos into a tan. And we know that tan theta is sine theta over cos theta. So if I call this one equation one and this one equation two, if I do equation one divided by equation two, I would get V sine beta divided by V cos beta is equal to E u sine alpha divided by u cos alpha. Notice it's this divided by this and this divided by this. Now you should spot some things happening here. V's will cancel, u's will cancel, sine beta divided by cos beta is tan beta and we have sine alpha divided by cos alpha which is tan alpha and we have E at the beginning. And we know some things about E. We know that E is between 0 and 1. So we're taking tan alpha and we're multiplying it by E. And E is going to be in between 0 and 1. So this tells me something about beta and alpha. I know that tan beta is always going to be less than or equal to tan alpha 
because it's always being multiplied by naught point something or possibly one or zero but that's why it's less than or equal to now if beta tan beta is less than tan alpha that is actually just saying that beta is less than alpha in other words the angle it bounces off the wall is smaller than it approaching the wall. And I can show you that in the diagram. This angle is smaller than this angle, and it makes sense because these stay the same, and this line is always going to be made smaller because some of the energy is lost when that ball hits the wall. There's one last bit that I need to speak about that we haven't even mentioned, which is this that the angle of deflection is the total angle through which the path of the sphere changes. With this diagram, it is alpha plus beta. And I'm just going to try and explain that over here in a bit more detail. So the ball is up here and it's traveling in this direction and then it bounces up and it travels over here. So this is the journey that it's making. This is alpha and this is beta. Now, if you imagine, um, I can't actually rotate the page. I wonder if I can rotate this. Yeah, let's have a go. I'm not very good at doing this. Here we go. Now, we're going to imagine that we are the ball and like we're in a driving seat, okay? And we're driving along this line that we've got here. Now, in order for us to rotate so that we end up with this as our vertical kind of line, so we're pretending we're driving upwards here, you might, this should work. We first of all have to rotate it alpha degrees. So it's like this. Then to get the top line vertical, we have to rotate it a further beta degrees. So the amount that it's having to rotate to deflect, first of all, it rotates alpha, then it rotates beta. Maybe that wasn't the clearest way. I might show it to you in a different kind of way. If you think about for this line to straighten up so that it's traveling like this, it has to move alpha. Then for it to go that way, it also has to rotate through beta. So the angle of deflection is alpha plus beta. Okay, I'm going to just pause the video at that point because that's the theory. We're then going to do some practical examples with this where it should make some more sense.